Hi, my name is uh, Josh Quitner, and we're going to talk today about venture capital and crypto. And I think just to get started, why don't we just have everybody do a quick round of introductions, even though I think you are all probably very well known to everybody in this room. W, you want to start? Yeah, so I can start. Uh, hey guys, my name is W1. So I'm founding partner of Primitive Ventures. We are a uh, global crypto asset holding company. Um, so we have been in the space. So me and my co-founder, Eric Melter, we have been in the space for the last few years. And um, so I'm on the board lecturer for Zcash and then also a vice board member for like, also for Quandesk. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tushar Jain. I'm co-founder and managing partner at Multicoin Capital. Um, and we are an active investor in the blockchain space. Hey everybody, Avich Lagarde, uh, co-founder, managing partner at Electric Capital. We focus on uh, uh, digital assets, mostly layer one protocols. Uh, prior to Electric, we were uh, serial entrepreneurs and uh, early investors in companies like Square, Pinterest, Airbnb, Coinbase, Boom, Supersonic, a bunch of other stuff. Great, thanks. And, and again, my name is Josh Quitner. I'm the editor-in-chief of Decrypt Media. And I've been writing about technology since around 1990. And I actually remember being on the original Cypherpunks mailing list. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I want to start with this question. Isn't, uh, isn't crypto VC sort of an oxymoron? I mean, if I believe in this world, don't I believe that you guys are going to be the first people to be disrupted? Yeah, so I think I can take that question. Like, first of all, um, if we, like, what define a venture capitalist, right? Like, venture capitalist tries to capture the things that's on the value, and then, and then so can invest capital, and then to get a venture return, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if we think about that's the role of, like, venture capitalist, and then I think, like, crypto is the ideal asset, just like the target asset for, like, VC. And um, I think like VC right now, like in just like just general term, it's more as like a structure thing. Like basically people are thinking about, okay, uh, folks on like Saint Hill Road and, and people who have like, you know, like wealthy LP and family offices. And um, like the things for us is, and we are actually not VC. We, like we don't have LP. And so we have investors, but like we invest in, like we invest like through our like balance sheet. And then because we believe that like the, like the great investor, like the great crypto like uh, investors, like like he or she should actually know how to lead without authority, because as like a traditional VC, and so like all the rights you have, so it's actually on the term, right? So so it's on basically like the documentation or like on the paper. You can sit on the board, and then so you can remove CEO and like, things like that. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, like, as a crypto investor, and I think we are actually on the same watermark as the founders. So, um, so, so, like, as a, so as a, so as a crypto investor, and like the most important thing for you is, so it's not about authority because like when people think about VC, so like they think about authority. Uh, so, but we have to invest and influence like without any authority, and then basically just like, on the same side of the founder. Mm -hmm. But Tushar, I remember reading in in Multicoin's letter to investors that one of the remarkable things that we just lived through in the huge boom time and subsequent collapse was that really, for one of the first times, Main Street investors, I mean, people who really didn't know anything, could participate in the very early formation of capital around these two ideas, and for better or worse, and a lot of worse. But, but doesn't that really sort of speak to this whole issue that the kind of traditional model, the traditional funding model that we all know and hate or love no longer applies. And VC is so much a part of that, raising venture to get these things off the ground. So uh, that's a really interesting question. And I, I want to focus, or I want to reframe it um, a little bit. And I want to say, you know, these markets are the least efficient markets that I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, it's just, it's amazing how inefficient these markets are. And whenever you have markets that are this inefficient, mm -hmm. you're going to see opportunities for professionals to come in and take advantage of the inefficiency, um, try to reduce the inefficiency, and by doing so, earn above market returns, right? And so as the crypto markets mature, I would expect that uh, you know, the traditional venture capital style investments will play less of a role. I think there won't be as many kingmakers in this industry. There won't be, you know, big $100 billion funds 
that uh, really get to decide which protocol wins or loses. Uh, however, I do think that there is still a really valuable role to be played in the industry by um, you know, smaller groups of highly motivated people who are pooling capital, but uh, you know, maybe not $100 billion worth of capital, but trying to add value to the industry. Um, I, I don't think that you know, retail investors are gonna take over and professionals are all out of a job uh, because retail investors, by very definition, are just not full-time. They're not gonna do the research. And if you don't do the research, you're not gonna have that fundamental edge. And so you're always gonna have a room for active investors. Can I, can I jump in here first? Yeah, please do. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I, okay, so if you back up and you say, what is a VC? Um, I think VCs kind of do three things. Uh, they give capital, mm -hmm. they help with governance, and uh, they help sort of operationally with the company, right? It's like you need to hire, you have somebody who's seen a bunch of companies scale and knows how best practices work and can help you think through those things. Mm -hmm. And I think what, um, what tokens do or what crypto does is it kind of unbundles those three. Uh, and so now you can have capital without necessarily having governance, or you can have capital without necessarily needing to take it from somebody who gives you operational advice. Um, and so that's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, it's just different. And so then in the market- But it would seem, but it would seem to strike right at the heart of what you just said VCs do, right? I mean, you provide those three things, and through the miracle of tokenization, we don't really need those th three things. Yeah, so I, th I think that was the worldview in like 2017 of like you just you can unbundle these things truly. Mm -hmm. And I think what people started to realize is there's actually excess capital in the wor capital in the world, and there are not enough people who actually can help you think through hard problems. And so very quickly over 2017 and part of 2018, I think we kind of started to reinvent a lot of the best practices that, that early stage founders and VCs figured out. Um, so for example, we realized, this is not exactly a VC related thing, but we kind of realized um, vesting is a good thing. Like giving your first four people on a team 100% of the tokens right away, and then the tokens are worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and then those people can walk away with tens of millions of dollars, probably not a good thing. Uh, like incentivizing people to be around for the long term is probably a good thing. Um, and so I think similarly, there are all of these other things that VCs, that smart VCs and good VCs do that create a lot in addition to the capital, and I think really good teams are starting to realize actually having long-term patient capital that's not going to dump when it first hits the market, mm -hmm. they can come in and help you solve hard problems, uh, can help you with co-founder disputes, can help you think about how to hire your first designer, can help you think about how to structure your engineering team. There are all these things that really, really high value add investors do, um, and so I think you're actually seeing a reconvergence back to what VC is. Yeah. Yeah, the microphone Mike is cutting seems out. a little flaky. Sorry, yeah. uh, I'm gonna hold it like this. Yeah. But I, but I, um, you're starting to, you're starting to see. Oh, no. Hold on, you've got, we've got somebody gonna change you out. Uh, so, I'll, I'll just jump in here yeah. real quick and, and continue the point because I think I, I agree with Vichel on bit. this. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, I think that the value add component here is really important, and actually. The best entrepreneurs, at least in my experience, aren't just looking for capital. They want, um, you know, they want investors who are these long, patient investors, like Avicho was saying. But also, uh, you want to work with professional investors because they get to see the breadth of everything that's happening. Whereas, if you're building something, you're very focused on building that one thing. Mm -hmm. And so, I think, you know, it's not necessarily just about the capital. People who aren't necessarily raising capital or deploying capital sometimes see announcements about you know so and so raised this much money or uh, there's this fund that launched and, and they think that this is all about just the capital uh, and in later stages maybe that becomes more true but especially in the very early stages which this industry I mean let's not kid ourselves every project is an early stage project basically uh, they need that extra help just the the pure capital is not enough right yeah, but, so but you said you said something that I'd like to come back to sure. which is that what we want is uh, founders that are gonna stick around for a while. But even that, to me, seems a little bit like anathema when we look at projects like, say, Augur, sure. where the completion of the project is releasing this distributed application and walking away, firing yourself. It's just so radically different from anything we've ever seen before. I, just, I, disagree, I disagree with the premise there. I don't think when it's, once it's launched, you're done. I think that's the starting point. You gotta build a community. I'm, I'm sorry. Can I, I'm yeah, I think that's the starting point. I don't think um, launching means you're done. I think you have to manage a community. You have to think about managing a foundation and deploying these resources over an extended period of time. I think 
Um, there's governance of the protocol. There's actually a lot that you have to think through, which is different than traditional venture. Um, but I don't think you get to sort of ship it and then walk away. Mm -hmm. um, kind of riffing on what Tushar was saying for a second, I think the place where potentially capital formation does get more disrupted is actually the pre-IPO stage, not the early stage venture stage. I think the early stage venture stage, the dynamics and the market are that it's, uh, there's a lot of capital and there are not that many people who can actually help you build companies. I think at the much later stages, sort of pre-IPO, we, we've talked a lot about more generally, I think, in, in VC or, or growth equity of this problem of uh, companies delaying their IPOs until later and later. And so actually most of the value pre-IPO is getting captured by a relatively small number of people whereas these companies previously would have gone public and, and exposed um, retail investors to that upside. Uh, I mean, you look at something like Uber today, no knock on kind of where their, their price is or anything like that, but um, you know, 10, 15 years ago before, before Sox, that would have gone public and, and retail investors would have seen some of that upside. That's where I think actually you might see more disruption because a lot of that money is not coming in uh, alongside things like access. You're already at a scale where what you really need is capital. Mm -hmm. um, so if I were actually a late stage person, I would be much more worried than an early stage person. So, so I have a little different opinion than um, like uh, our show was saying that um, first of all, and I think the early stage VC is going to be disrupted in like two ways. First of all, if we see early stage venture and they're like, so like the traditional early stage venture, they're highly concentrated, right? So they're all in San Hill and they're all in Beijing. So they're all like in London, say for instance. So it's basically, it's a very regional business. And then so they invest in like a regional monopoly. So that's a traditional early stage VC, like so, so, that's, so that's basically like their model, right? So like uh, lowercase invest in Twitter and in, so, and then like has a huge stake in Uber and then like benchmark basically 20% in Uber. So like the traditional VC, they are very regional, like relatively in like one country. And then like also like they, so they basically ask for enough ownership. So they want to have the dominance of the ownership. And I think like that mentality gonna hurt a lot like when it comes to like crypto investment because if you think about the governance model, especially for POS, right? So if you hold 20% of the token and like the governance is just like totally messed up. Um, so I think that early stage VC gonna be like gonna be like, so I would say not probably not being disrupted but like being like disassembled. Right. Like disassembled in like a much more like distributed manner. Yeah, a much more I, efficient I, manner. Well, it's it's evolving. Think, and I think it'll be different people. So Dovey and I agreed before the panel that we would vehemently disagree with whatever the other person <laughs> said. So she's falling through on her side of the bargain. Um, uh, but I think, you know, it's, it, it's, what I would agree with though is that it's, you know, it's not gonna be the traditional name brand VCs of mm -hmm. today on Sand Hill Road that are gonna be the dominant Crypto VCs, to your point, I think they get it. You just have to do totally different things to succeed in crypto, and so that's why you're not really seeing, other than Andreessen Horowitz with A16Z Crypto, you're not really seeing those same names in the space. Um, but I think that it just changes the role for what the early stage VC is, and I think you'll see a lot of the same dynamics, which is a relatively small number of people will have disproportionate access. Um, there will be way too much money sloshing around, and entrepreneurs will get to pick who they want to work with, and they will choose to work with a relatively small number of people, like less than 10. Mm -hmm. uh, like less than 10 firms will actually matter. Um, You're saying crypto firms. And crypto, crypto firms. yes. Well, W, you said something yesterday on a, a similar panel uh, talking about VC, and I, I thought it was really profoundly interesting, and it hadn't quite occurred to me, which is that one of the things that's going to change, you mentioned Sand Hill Road, Forget about Sand Hill Road, forget about actually possibly the United States and its dominance in venture. Yeah. This is a very worldwide VC thing, yep. right? Yep. And so that's going to open up all sorts of new opportunities, right? Yeah, so like simply just go to core market cap, right? So the top 20 tokens out there, and then how many of those are like American founded project? Like there's only probably four mm -hmm. at most, right? Right. Um, and, and then so because I've been investing like globally, and we have offices in um, like Singapore, Shanghai, and like Hong Kong, and like Boston, like um, SF. And so, so we have seen that, um, Many of our fellow investors, like like basically who we like co-invest a lot, many of them are like self-made like crypto investor. Like say for instance, like he or she might be like like um, early stage like Ethereum like uh, so Ether pre-sale whale, right? Or, or or just like Cosmos like early investor, like Cosmos in like Cosmos pre-sale. Because I think the early like the early wealth accumulation of like this space is like. So it's much, much more faster like, than, like, so than like traditional venture space. 
if I'm a VC and I can only get the cash back like after the liquidation, like usually like the life cycle is like eight to 10 years. Like eight to 10 years, like right now in Silicon Valley from like first investment like to the eventual IPO, like average like takes about eight years. Mm -hmm. So I think like the, like the pace is just different. And then like that's why we will have like a different profile of people and then have that capital dry powder, like so like to make an investment. Mm -hmm. And also like when it comes to the crypto, uh, so like the crypto investor mentality, uh, one thing I, so, so I, so I probably talk about it is, um, because the traditional VC has the authority to, so to manage the company, right? So basically the CEO actually reports to all the board members. Um, but like we don't have that kind of authority. Like so Vitaly does not have to report to any of these early stage, like, like either pre-sale whales, right? And so like, like the role of VC is very much like, like a politician or like very much like a diplomat. And so you have to get that influence just like without that title or like without that like paper made like authority. Um, so that, so like that's actually a lot of like traditional venture capitalists, so they don't usually do. And I think they're more, um, you know, like more passive investor or just like they basically interact with the team only. Mm -hmm. uh, so like yeah. Tushar has a really good turn, like probably Tushar can talk about it. Oh yeah, uh, so I think, you know, for successful investors in this space, uh, people need to have a public profile. Um, I think in the traditional venture space, you could have been a very private investor, not been very loud, not had a big following, but been extremely successful. However, in this industry, uh, because of what Davi was mentioning, you, know, you don't sit on the board of Ethereum. There is no board of Ethereum. There's no board of Bitcoin, obviously, right? Um, and you don't get to govern the team, but you do get to govern the network, right? And in order to govern the network, it's more uh, an art of consensus building, making sure your view is heard, making sure that your opinions are understood and that you're able to communicate some of these very complex governance questions in terms that most of the average holders can actually understand, yeah. right? And that's why, you know, for example, speaking for my firm, Multicoin Capital, we invest a lot of time, energy, and money in communications and having a big brand because we want to have a bunch of content out there um, and help educate people in order to participate in network level governance because we know that we will not necessarily have the opportunity to participate, to participate in team governance, um, especially for any projects that you know, have already launched um, and the token is already floating. So, so traditionally, um, traditional venture, venture 1.0 and venture 2.0 was very high risk, high reward, right? I mean, the, these were people who are out there looking for Apple Computer and Microsoft and later on Google and Facebook and they put money in and then got a astounding, astounding valuation. <laughs> well anyway, are you are you are you able to see yeah. things like that? Um, I mean are, do you think that what what does venture what does venture three point oh look like? Is it still going to be high risk, high reward? What I'm kind of hearing here yeah. is that just as, as crypto itself is decentralized, venture is decentralized, and things are going to be diluted a, a bit as a result of that, right? Or yeah. do you think you, you're going to find the next Google, so like the next the, Facebook? I think the risk profile is the same, right? So like the risk profile is the same, and, and um, so if we talk about absolute, just like percentage-wise capital return, and I think it's the same, like it's the same scale, um, but probably not the same as the absolute money-wise, right? So like that's why like I was were saying like the AUM not gonna be like a few billion dollar like venture firm, right? Um, so like like uh, that's my opinion. Finally, an opening. I disagree with Dubby. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. uh, no, I think I, I think if you look at the market sizes here, you're talking about potentially a hundred trillion dollars. Like what is what is in a really really abstract sense? What is crypto? Crypto is internet native money, and then a bunch of computer code that can own money. And you look around the world and you're like, wow, a lot of the world is money and rules around money, around who owns the money and under what circumstances are allowed to own the money. That's like a trust, that's a will, that's reads, that's securities, that's derivatives. But a lot of the world, literally tens of trillions, if not a hundred trillion dollars plus of the world is actually basically legal code that wraps money. Um, and so through that lens, I think if you play this forward for 25 years, it's gonna look something like e-commerce or media on the internet where you realize that there's this you know, tens of trillions of dollars that are slowly being eaten up by this new platform, and the companies that sort of form around that, whether they're layer one protocols, which are much, much more decentralized, or companies like 
Coinbase that are much more centralized. So you like aggregate value there, you're talking about, I think, tens of trillions, if not 100 trillion plus. And so I think it's totally plaus plausible that in 20 years, the big VC winners here actually have like tens of billions of dollars under management. Um, I mean, traditional venture, if you go back to like the 80s, was also really small. It was like tens of millions of dollars, and then it scaled up massively for you know, 20 years. I remember hearing years ago that the whole market for okay, the so. internet was $1 trillion, <laughs> yeah. and you're saying it's 100x that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Also, I, yeah, I would, I would agree happens. with Avichal really strongly that the market here is enormous. Um, and I think that the market is enormous not only for the money use case, that, that you mentioned, uh, I think that's absolutely huge. But I also think like the core strength that blockchain has is it brings markets to industries that currently have, uh, that, that are very centralized and have ossified power structures, right? So it, like the way that I framed it in my head is it's the war between kind of like think about the Cold War, right? You have capitalism, which is all about using markets to allocate resources, and then you have these authoritarian or communist countries back in the day that were all about using a command and control structure in order to allocate resources. And now you look at industries like telecom. Well, telecom is not really markets anymore. It's really a command and control centralized infrastructure that decides how resources are allocated. You look at financial services. Financial services are a little bit better at being markets, but it's not really purely open markets. There's a lot of regulatory capture and a lot of inefficiency that makes it more centralized and command and control type economies. And just like in the Cold War, we saw that capitalist market-based economies won. I think that the blockchain-based protocols are going to absolutely take over all of those industries. OK, I disagree. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I will go first. And so I, so I disagree with uh, Tushar in the sense that um, I think money is the biggest application. And then just I think about our traditional like, monetary policy or like system, right? We have like, AM0, and we have like, base currency, and we have like, border currency. And then once we have the base currency, like once base currency in like cryptocurrency, like na uh, very native format, and then we can have all this like derivative or, or application on top of this uh, hard money. So let me give a very simple example. And so me and my co-founder has been like brainstorming, and then what should be the like the first like contract based, just smart contract based application. And so if we think about why we need smart contract, because the current transaction has a lot of uncertainty, right? So like there's counterparty risk, like a lot of efficiency like coming from counterparty risk. And then a lot of so and then a lot of efficiency like coming from just like uh, information asymmetry and also like uh, ambiguity, right? So ambiguity of our human language. And think about prenup, right? Think about Jeff Bezos. So if we can have the prenup like design in a like, smart contract, and then because it's only asset, so it is like, not about so because like the decision making is relatively simple, so so it's only at the asset layer, right? It's basically division of the asset. So like that kind of thing should actually be on smart contract hundred percent, right? There shouldn't be any ambiguity because of our so because of our current legal system. And there's a lot of things like this that should migrate to uh, so should uh, migrate to the blockchain rail, but the thing is that the underlying uh, foundation is always money. So I really don't see this like uh, work computer thing gonna be on smart contract. Like like just that uh, that's not like you know like that's not what the blockchain is building for. Like blockchain is not for efficiency. It is not. Um, it is for trust problem, right? So it is for third party trusted problem. I agree with Javi. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I, I disagree here. <laughs> In the few minutes we have left, I'm sure there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the room who would like to hear what, what you're looking for. What are you looking for? What are, the, what are the, I mean, kind of roll in your own investment thesis, but what are the, what are the fish you're looking for here? Debbie, you have to start so I can disagree with you. Okay, so I will try to start. Um, so first of all, we're like thesis list. And so you're, like, I'm sorry, you're so we're a thesis list. Um, like just like the name of our firm and like we're primitive ventures and, and we have real, like we are in a very primitive space and I think we're just in the first three minutes of the entire like hard internet native money like history. And so we don't want to pigeonhole ourselves like into you know, a specific sector or like thesis. Like the only belief we have is that money is the biggest application. Okay, uh, and what we are looking for is uh, I really think the talent is the lagging indicator right now for our industry. 
and I think like Avacha, like so, like Avacha is a great entrepreneur, and then so like so his previous company was sold to Facebook, and and I think like Avacha can talk about what's the talent gap here. But uh, I used to work for eBay for like, four years as a like product manager, and then and then I know what is a good talent looks like. So both from engineering perspective, from product design, from like like economic design, and I know what good talent looks like. But I think the current industry is definitely lack. So it's definitely lagging on that aspect. Um, and like the type of founder that we are looking for, first of all, and I want, uh, so we are looking for someone who can like lead without authority and who can influence without pedigree and then, and then who are also rebellious enough. And I think a lot of a traditional, you know, like Silicon Valley darling, and they're actually not rebellious enough. But, but like we are in the industry that eventually gonna disrupt the sovereign money, right? So I think I want like a combination of both lion and pirate. Um, so it's that pirate is, lions. so like the lion, that like because like, so I always try to depict like, like an individual person, like can I describe him or her as like animal? Um, so talking about it, and I want the founder to be a lion as well as a pirate right. with high integrity. So you're looking more <laughs> yeah. for a personality type, but not a specific idea, yep. not a sector. Okay. So um, I think something that's, that's really important when investing in space is to think about timing. You know? and, and let me give you a reason why. Uh, and I'll give you an analogy. So I'll give you a, an analogy. If you look at a lot of the companies in the dot-com boom, a lot of those companies failed, obviously, but, they're, but they work now, right? Instacart is just web van again. Like a lot of those ideas were invented back when the technology was first really popularized and people started to understand what it could do. But you know what? If you invested in those, you lost a lot of money. If you were an entrepreneur in those, you know, maybe you made a little bit of money, but I mean, honestly, your company didn't work, right? And so I think timing is really, really important. And so, uh, I think that the order in which this technology will be applied to markets and the order in which it will be adopted is really important to think about. I think that the first and most um, obvious use case is really on open finance. Uh, I know others, uh, it, it's also known as decentralized finance or DeFi. I don't think the decentralization is the goal. I think it's just a means to an end. I think the openness is a goal. So uh, we like to call it open finance. But I think open finance is really valuable and we're very interested in investing in this space because it's very near term. There are things that are already possible today with these open financial applications that were not possible before. For example, trustless derivatives that allow anyone in the world to have access to uh, US equity markets. I or lookalikes to US equity markets. I disagree. <laughs> right? Uh, I think that having these products that open inclusion to various financial primitives is really, really important and very near term. Then the, the second horizon that I see is things with Web3 applications. And there, it's actually more of a supply side argument, not, uh, not necessarily a demand side argument. I don't think that the consumers actually care that your application is decentralized. And if that's your pitch, you know, that's probably not gonna work very well from a marketing perspective. But I think that entrepreneurs are not incentivized to build on top of the Web2 monopolies anymore. And I think that investors are not incentivized to invest on companies building on Web2 monopolies anymore. When you look at examples of what you know, Facebook did to Zynga, what Google did to Yelp, uh, and there's countless other examples like that that show you that it's not safe to go build your company on a Web2 monopoly. And so I think the future of applications and of interesting companies will be built on Web3. Um, and then I think the third and longest term outcome is what Dovey was talking about, which is the state free money or challenging sovereign currencies. I think that that's going to happen, but I just think it's much further away than you know people in the industry want it to be. Okay, so I want to quickly chime in here. Like, so the reason why Bitcoin actually aiming 8,000 right now is because of the geopolitical tension because US and China, like largely. So I've got like tons of like messages like today, like from my Chinese whale saying, like, how can I buy more Bitcoin? 
And so I really think the sovereign money thing gonna come faster than we expected. And then so like we have seen what happened to Venezuela, right? Like the once the richest country, like the once the richest country in the world, right now it's a complete just trash, right? The currency crisis just like like broke the country. So. I think that will probably come hand in hand with like Web3 and then all this. And then so like all the forces coming together are like gonna be a huge revolution. Okay, yeah. Agree to disagree. We're just about out of time and, and you have another one. Oh, yes. Uh, I agree with Dovey. Um, I also think Web3 is not gonna happen anytime soon. Uh, we, we, our, our version of this uh, is programmable money. So it doesn't really matter that it's decentralized. What matters is that computers can control the money and that has downstream consequences. The thing I'll say is uh, generally agree with most of this, and I think you guys probably heard this before. The one thing that I, I wish people were doing rather than a particular idea is a slightly different approach. I think because there are so many great uh, technical people in the space, they tend to approach it tech first, and you get these really horizontal platforms that can do a lot of things. And I think if you look back at the history of things that actually get to scale and are adopted, they tend to start much more narrow and they tend to be much more vertical. So they solve a, a problem and people may not even realize that what's happening behind the scenes or the infrastructure that it's built on. Uh, and then over time they become much more horizontal. And so I think um, uh, something like figure is really interesting. You can do home equity lines of credit. Yeah, behind the scenes there's like maybe a blockchain or something happening. We're not investors in figure by the way, just using it as an example of something I think um, uh, might actually work, and I think you're going to see a lot more of those, and I think that's actually a huge opportunity, is actually using the infrastructure in a way that your end consumer or your end customer may not even realize that it's sitting on top of this infrastructure, but it gives them all of these new benefits, and then over time, because you've actually bootstrapped uh, the technology use case, you can go much more horizontal, which is if you look back at Microsoft Office and, and Windows, if you look at Maps or some of the applications, you know, the, the App Store on top of uh, iPhone. Like, a, there's there's a very long history of actually solving vertical problems that then back into a platform, which I think we're as a as an industry we're kind of underinvested in right now. There's just not enough people doing that. Great, thank you all very much. It was good for me. I hope it was good for you. Thank Thanks, you. guys.